Prof. Tomiko, Prof. Theo, Your Excellency, ladies and gentlemen. You have heard both the professors speak on the powers of the elected presidency. This forum is timely because of the recent discussions indicate that there is some confusion on what the elected president can actually do as set out in the Constitution, and some of the discussion seems to be divorced from constitutional legal reality. What I will try and do is set out briefly the constitutional position of the presidency before the 1991 amendments, to consider the effect of the 1991 amendments, which provided for the elected presidency and gave specific additional powers to the office, discuss in that context some of the points that have been made recently as to what powers the president should or might exercise, and for the extent to which these powers are grounded in legal reality. The points I will make in summary are, one, the president, the elected president can be highly influential, he has significant powers, and two, much of the discussion so far on the powers of the president have not focused on the real powers and influence. Instead, the focus has been on issues which have no basis in law, whether he can speak in public to contradict the government, disagree with the government, and so on. In law, it's quite clear the president has no such powers, and that was not the role that was envisaged for the president. Let me deal with the presidency before the 1991 amendments. The Constitution provides for the institutions of state, including the presidency, parliament, executive, judiciary. Our presidency is a constitutional presidency. It is created by the Constitution, and the Constitution is the sole source of powers for the presidency. The Queen in the UK is slightly different in that, in theory, she herself inherently is the fount of power and honor, but circumscribed by conventions and law as well, and I'll come back to this later. Our president is head of state, and ours is a system where the head of state is different from the head of government, unlike the US, France, and so on. And in our system, the head of state generally has three functions. One, the constitutional functions, mainly formal, like appointing the prime minister, dissolving legislature, and so on. There are some areas where the Constitution gives him important reserve powers, like the decisions on dissolution of parliament. Many of us remember the arguments in Malaysia. Whether the prime minister commands the confidence of parliament, the president has to decide, but really don't need to go into those issues right now. The second of his three duties are the ceremonial duties, which most of us recognize, and the third, the symbolic, representing the entire country. And if you wanted a reference, you can refer to Bogdanov on the monarchy and the constitution. He was a professor of law at Oxford and reader in government. For present purposes, I look at the constitutional functions. Most of the discussion today relates to this aspect, and I'll make three points. One, on the discharge of his constitutional functions, the president can only act and speak as advised by the cabinet. And I choose my words very carefully. Two, this does not mean that the president cannot have real influence. He can wield influence through his regular discussions with the prime minister. And three, the president has to keep confidential his discussions with the prime minister. Let me elaborate a little on each of these three positions. Points. First, the legal position of the president in discharging his duties, all public acts of the president, including public speech, can only be on the advice of cabinet. Second, he cannot act any act in his own volition in any public aspect. The possible exceptions to these two points are in respect of the powers specifically vested in the office of the presidency. And three, the president cannot reject any advice given by cabinet. And four, crucially important, the president has to be impartial and must be seen to be impartial in political debates. These principles are crystallized, and I've asked for handouts to be given. First, in Article 21.1, it crystallizes this when it says, except as provided by the Constitution, the president shall it's not may, but shall, in the exercise of his functions under the Constitution or any other written law, act in accordance with the advice of the cabinet, 
or of a minister acting under the general authority of the cabinet. And Article 24.2 of the Constitution is equally clear. It says, subject to the provisions of this Constitution, the cabinet shall have the general direction and control of government and shall be collectively responsible to parliament. These constitutional provisions reflect the law as developed over centuries in many countries of the Commonwealth. For example, one can refer to a, a letter and a note that then Prime Minister Stanley Baldwin wrote to King Edward VIII in December 1936. It's in part three of your handout. The letter is interesting in itself, but the note makes absolutely crystal clear the constitutional position in the UK. And I have said to you, the Queen in theory, it is her cabinet, it's her army, it's her ministers. She is a sovereign in a much more powerful position compared to the president who is created by the constitution. And this is what Stanley Baldwin told the king. I'm reading from the note. It's a fundamental constitutional principle that the king's ministers must take responsibility for every public act of the king. For the king himself can do no wrong. And it follows as a necessary corollary that ministers must have the right to tender advice before the act is done. This principle is the basis of constitutional monarchy, and if the king disregarded it, the monarchy would cease to be constitutional. Two, it would be a great bre grave breach of constitutional principle if the sovereign were to make a public statement on any matter of public interest except on the advice of the ministers. There can be no doubt about it. Three, apparent exceptions to the rule that the king's public utterances must be such as are approved by his ministers, such as King George's Christmas messages are not really exceptions at all. Four, the king is bound to accept and act upon the advice of his ministers in this connection. For the king to broadcast in disregard of that advice would be appealing over the heads of his constitutional advisors. There is a further principle involved. The constitutional duty of the king is not to take sides in any matter of public controversy. If he does so on minister's advice, of course, they alone are responsible. But if he does so without their advice or in defiance of it, he ceases to act as a constitutional monarch, and his intervention is calculated to divide his subjects into opposing camps. All the king wanted to do was to make a speech explaining why he wanted to marry Mrs. Wallace Simpson. The king could not, under the constitutional principles, even speak about the woman he wanted to marry, except as authorized by the British cabinet. What more if he had wanted to speak about transport, or whether transport operators should be nationalized, or the cost of living. I have given you a reference to Bogdanov on this point as well, which is in part one of your handout. And the same principles apply in other jurisdictions of the Commonwealth. The principles, as I said, would be even more applicable to a presidency as to whether he gets more powers by reason of elections. That's... I. I'm tempted to say it's absolute nonsense. It is absolute nonsense, but I will come back to it later. The, our constitutional provisions, Article 21.1, 24.2, they crystallize the English principles and conventions. And being the lawyer, I will trace that for you. Our constitution is based on the Malaysian Federal Constitution, which in turn is based on the Indian Federal Constitution, which in turn followed the English constitutional position that the head of state must act on the advice of his ministers in all public matters. And I've given you a reference to the statement to the Indian Constitutional Convention by the first president, Dr. Rajendra Prasad. It's in your handouts. Given the time limitations, I won't read what he says. But in India, they don't have an equivalent of Article 21. And despite that, they say they will follow the English position. We made it clear. And the Reid Commission, which drafted the Malayan Commission, Malayan Constitution also made it clear that the head of state will act on the advice of the cabinet. The rationale for this approach is that the president symbolizes and represents the entire country, and as such, he has to be above the fray, and the power to legislate must be with the parliament, and this is also to protect the presidency, because if he speaks only on the advice of cabinet, then his office is not burdened by the responsibility, the outcomes of specific policies. This does not mean that the president cannot be highly influential, 
He receives all cabinet papers, and he meets the prime minister regularly, and he is entitled to discuss a wide range of issues, and the influence can be considerable. Any prime minister will be foolish if he does not give way to such advice, especially if the president has had substantial experience, is wise and knowledgeable, and trusted and respected by the prime minister. Whether the president actually wields that influence obviously depends on who the president whether the yes depends on who the president is if he is someone who commands little or no respect of the prime minister then of course influence will be limited i have given you references to bagot as well as bogdano on the uk situation on the nature of the influences bagot sets out the famous three rights of the sovereign duty to warn she can ex, well the queen she can tell the prime minister look i warn you these things happened previously in my experience you should take and consider carefully what you want to do but it is for the prime minister to then ultimately decide and bogdano makes clear that ultimately the head of state whether sovereign or uh, constitutional head of state has no right whatsoever to overrule the cabinet and the government third point the president has to keep the discussions confidential again i have given a reference to bogdano which is in part 1 of your handout and in the interest of time i'm not going to read it but the rationale for keeping it confidential is that if you don't keep it confidential the prime minister will cease to have any meaningful discussions with the president Now the 1991 amendments introducing the elected presidency professor co went through it set out the extensive powers there has hardly been any discussion on the nature of these powers if you think about it carefully all key appointments are subject to a veto spending of the government drawing on reserves is subject to a veto these are very extensive powers it's an actual serious check on the government but so far the discussion has not focused on the real powers that the president has it checks against a corrupt government it checks against a government that wants to corrupt the machinery of government through crony appointments whether in the judiciary or in the civil service or in strat boards so extremely important powers very influential the impact of these amendments though are that we started with a position where we took the english position and put it in and made it clear through articles 21 and 24 that executive power rests with the cabinet but at the same time we added specific powers to the president very substantial powers in those areas obviously he acts as set out in the constitution sometimes with the advice of the presidential council and in some cases in his own discretion the constitution makes clear article 21 25 that prof theo referred to refers to that situation where the president is given specific discretion then where the constitution provides that he has got discretion then obviously he can act in his own discretion and overrule the cabinet that's clear that's what the constitution provides and at the time the amendments were made all the senior ministers made very clear what the provis- what the powers were what the intention was and uh, i have given you the references what i would do is probably read what mr lee kuan yew in his own inimitable style said he said this i pointed out that those who were hoping that the president could act as a counterforce to the government they were wrong because all he can do is to protect the reserves and protect the integrity of appointments If you want a counter to the government a check against the government you must have them in the opposition and then he was asked a question i think by savia as to whether the presidency amounts to clipping of the wings of the prime minister and he said if i had delivered that speech i would not have used those words because clipping one's wings would evoke in my mind the swans we have at botanic gardens they are there because they cannot fly away and i would not have used that metaphor because i would not want a prime minister who cannot get up on his feet and do what he wants In no article or sub article of the constitution is the president given executive power 
He has a certain veto, a certain blocking power, partly because I was by training a lawyer. So the principal provisions were enacted. I took some care to make quite sure that this mechanism we were putting in place would not obstruct the government from doing what it legitimately should be able to do. Quite clear. The provisions are clear. The constitutional conventions are clear. And the speeches when the bill was put through are absolutely clear. The president must act on the advice of cabinet on the discharge of his duties. He cannot speak publicly on his use of the day except as advised by the cabinet. And he nevertheless has specific powers, very important specific powers under the 1991 amendments. And of course, he will continue always to wield substantial influence depending on who he is. Let me end by making some comments on the recent discussions. All these discussions about whether the president can speak publicly on issues, whether he can act as a check on the government, whether he can consult the public and give feedback. Because he is elected, he has got authority. One can ask, do any of these people refer to the Constitution? What is the constitutional authority for all these statements? They are quite innocent of any legal basis. Elections, for example, are a process intended to confer moral authority in respect to the discretionary powers expressly vested on the president. Can they alter the scope of the powers that are set out in the Constitution? Let me put it the other way around. For Parliament and Cabinet, we are also elected. Does that mean that we have greater powers than what has been given to us under the Constitution? Once I ask that question, the absurdity of the proposition becomes obvious. Really, these discussions are disconnected from the underlying legal reality. We've had acres of media space on these discussions, but they are quite unconnected with the legal reality. It would have been more useful to focus on the real questions, which is the influence and serious specific powers that the president can wield, and what sort of person can be most effective in wielding such power. If the head of state challenges the government, he'll be acting unconstitutionally. In the UK, the last time that was done was in 1642 by Charles I. And the king lost both his life and his throne for his trouble. And you will see from that note that is flashed on the screen, this is a note I referred to earlier on. This is a draft of that note we got from the UK office. Somebody, one of the lawyers in the UK office had drafted the reference to King Charles I. But Prime Minister Baldwin decided to remove it. But that's the reality of the point. Nowadays, of course, we deal with these issues through the courts. With that, let me end by with these points. The real questions that we should be asking would be, who will best protect the reserves? Who has the knowledge, the skill, the acumen? Who will best command the confidence and respect of the prime minister, the cabinet, to be able to influence them? Who has a gravitas and stature, stature to be the symbol of the country? What I would call, quote, unquote, the wrong questions would be, who is going to be speak up publicly? Who is going to contradict the government? Who is going to engage publicly on political issues? Wrong questions, because the president can't do any of these things. He'll be acting unconstitutionally. I promise another 30 seconds. <laughs> Even leaving aside the law and the Constitution, let's take a step back and ask, what is the purpose for aspirants to presidential candidacy saying, I will go public, I will take on the government, I will do all these things? If their intention was really to influence the government, do they or you or anyone else believe that that's the best way to influence a government? Or is it simply to be popular? And once you start going down that road, to say I will make statements on issues, but I will not be partisan, is akin to saying I can be a little bit pregnant. Because inevitably, when you start taking sides on issues or expressing your views on issues of the day, you will be taking sides. Is that what the presidency is all about? Thank you. <laughs>